would you say that it's fair to make the parallel that DevOps supports software engineering analogously to the way that MLOps supports data science and machine learning model development? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, those tools are still developing our ability to use them and how we think we should use them is also just very nascent. So I think there's, there's still more to come. I would say for me, the simplest explanation of MLOps is you are developing the tooling and the infrastructure to make productionizing, to make developing, productionizing, and deploying models a lot easier. Makiko, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I've been excited to have you on air. I've known about you for so long, and I can't believe that now I get to talk to you and ask you all the questions I've been waiting to ask. Where in the world are you calling in from, Makiko? I'm coming from the beautifully muggy and foggy city of San Francisco. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, what's that? There's a quote by a famous American author that's something like, I've never had a colder winter than my summer in San Francisco or something. Ernest Hemingway. Oh, that sounds <laughs> absolutely accurate. Although I guess people who are in Boston would be like, ah, it's from a Boston winter. Why don't you? <laughs> Um, at least they have a summer, I think was the point was that yeah. in San Francisco, it's like winter year round. Um, well, it is a, a hop in city for machine learning, machine learning operations. So I imagine lots of interesting things for you to do out there, uh, even despite the, uh, maybe not ideal weather. Plus you also have lots of wonderful weather climates within a few hours drive all kinds of treats. Absolutely. And I have to say, like, I was born and raised in the city, so I'm a little bit biased, but um, I, I, there's no other place I'd really want to be, especially for the kind of work that I do. Um, you know, and also too, like being close to my family. It's been great. That is nice. That is an important thing. All right. So we had never met before recording this episode. Like we had never had a conversation before. But I've known who you are through various people for it feels like years. So it seems like perhaps the linchpin in all of this is Harpreet Sahota, who was in episode number 457 on the Super Data Science podcast, because he runs uh, his Artists of Data Science happy hours, uh, where anybody can drop in. Those are on Fridays, right? Yep. Fridays at, uh, what was it? It's 2, 3 p.m. PST. So don't remember uh, what the time is Winnipeg time. Yeah, it's like 5 p.m. It is Winnipeg time. I guess it would be uh, 3 p.m. in Winnipeg, I think, for Harpreet locally. Um, and you've met tons. We have tons of mutual connections from you doing that. I've actually never been to the happy hour. I would love to do that. Um, but tons of guests on the show have been... Uh, in that happy hour, you're saying Mark Freeman, he was a recent guest. Yeah. Um, Serge Massis is the researcher for the Super Data Science podcast. So uh, before a guest comes on air, Serge does a detailed deep dive into their history. He studies YouTube videos, lectures that they've given, blog posts that they've written, journal articles that they've written. And he comes up with the most amazing questions that uh, bridge different parts of people's careers that tie threads together across their careers. And also um, he asks questions that nobody that nobody else on the planet could be asked. Like he'll come up with, he's got questions for you that, we'll, that I'll ask you today that based on your specific experience, Makiko, nobody else uh, could possibly be asked the same question. So Serge is absolutely brilliant. And he also has a very popular Super Data Science episode, number 539. Uh, he wrote to me, uh, before he provided me with the questions for you for today, he also said that Mikiko is so smart and always has something interesting to say. So he's looking forward to hearing this episode, no doubt. And uh, yeah, so that's someone else from those Artists of Data Science uh, happy hours, right? That you know. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and Serge is such a great guy. It's so funny because I guess like you never, you kind of never know who's watching you in a way. <laughs> um, a lot of these people I consider my friends, but I also consider them people that I look up to, especially when thinking about how to develop and grow my own career in ML ops. That's so nice to hear. Yeah, Serge is absolutely wonderful. Um, 
And yeah, so listeners, check out if you've got questions about your data science career that you'd like to ask a stable of brilliant data science leaders and content creators, that happy hour is a great way to do that. Um, so speaking of Serge's questions, uh, here is one from him. So he points out, Makiko, that you're a content creator on Medium, Substack, YouTube, and on NVIDIA's blog, lots of other places. We're going to talk about some more of those uh, later in this episode. And you use all this content creation to share your tips on machine learning operations, ML ops, as well as production machine learning and entering the field of data science or machine learning. Um, previously, you mentored folks at Springboard. You also mentor interns at your job. You wrote a software engineering course called Software Engineering Skills 101. And you run the Data Book Club at MailChimp, where you work. So clearly, mentorship and teaching is a big part of your life. It seems like it's something that's very important to you. Where does that come from? When did that get started? Yeah, I think it it comes from like two or three main places. One was the fact that, you know, whenever I was kind of at sort of a critical juncture in terms of my career, um, I always had, you know, even if I I didn't have resources, I had one or two people, key, you know, linchpins that were able to like help teach me the skills I needed to get through to like, you know, the crucible and on to the next stage that happened the first time I got a job at a startup and I had no programming skills. My friend who, you know, was a researcher who used R a lot, you know, helped me understand, pick up enough of it to like write up a script to do (laughs) the analysis for like the, you know, take home interview. That was like one key point because it was my very first job in tech. Um, And I didn't have anyone in my family that I knew of that worked in tech before. Um, There were, so many kind of linchpin critical moments like that where someone was willing to kind of reach out a hand and help pull me through in this kind of the classic, you know, mentor, teacher, apprentice style. So that's something that I kind of want to help give to other people, understanding that not everyone like has the right resources, has the right educational background um, to be able to succeed in a, in a very, very demanding industry. So that's part of it. A second part was uh, <laughs> when I was younger, uh, I had a lot of issues with reading, actually, which is funny oh. because I love reading now. But in elementary school, I was considered very slow. Um, and actually, that's been the feedback I've gotten a lot of times when I was growing up, both in mm-hmm. elementary school, middle school and high school, was that I was hardworking, but I was not quite bright. Just not right <laughs> enough to to pass the line, you know? And I think part of that was because I was surrounded by people who didn't have that growth mindset. They really thought in terms of you either got it or you don't. And I think that's a very damaging attitude. So right. eventually, you know, when I graduated college and I had to kind of reset what I knew and understood of how someone succeeds in the world, part of it was like learning about the growth mindset and it's understanding that people's skills and experiences are very, very adaptable and flexible. And that was just life changing for me. Because before I was almost helpless to this idea that, oh, I'm hard working, but I'm not quite bright, kind of like a golden retriever. <laughs> you know, no one, no one wants to be told that. Um, but, you know, when I had that critical piece of information, uh, I was able to then start to teach myself how to fish. And I think those experiences of constantly being underestimated, constantly being told, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're so sweet. You're so nice. Uh, Maybe you should try (laughs) going into something with people away from technical stuff. Oh, maybe, you know, you're not good with numbers or what have you, Um, you know, made me understand that, like, look, at the end of the day, like, you should allow people and you should give people the tools for them to kind of self-determine their own destiny. Um, And all those people were wrong. I mean, maybe, maybe they're not wrong. Maybe I'm not quite bright. Uh, maybe I am still more hardworking than I am bright, but I have to say I enjoy my life a lot more and certainly my career. I don't know. Just from the conversation that we were having prior to recording, I can confidently say that you are, in fact, quite bright. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that growth mindset or whatever has certainly uh, has transformed you or 
allowed parts of you to come out and flourish. Uh, yeah, you're you're an exceptional uh, leader in this space. Uh, to wit, you have uh, a machine learning operations course that you're currently working on. Mm -hmm. So first of all, maybe we should break down for the listener what machine learning operations is. Absolutely. And this is something that, uh, you know, I was developing a blog post series about it. I, I initially scoped it to like five pages. So I'm like, you know, I don't know if people will even read five pages. And I just kept writing, writing, ended up being a 24 page blog that I'm currently <laughs> trimming down to now, you know, turn to videos. Um, because it, defining what is MLOps is just, it's so controversial right now in that space. Everyone has their different lines, everyone has their diagrams that they're putting out there. Um, I would say for me, the simplest explanation of MLOps is you are developing the tooling and the infrastructure to make productionizing, to make developing, productionizing and deploying models a lot easier. Nice. And that we could sense. add in, we can add in more things too, like easier, more accurate, more robust, all that, but that's ultimately what it is. So in a big enough team that can afford to have more than just data scientists and software engineers, you have this yeah. additional role, machine learning operations that helps data scientists to create models more efficiently to do their work um, more replicably um, to ensure that there's redundancy if something goes wrong, uh, that experiments are recoverable, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because, um, you know, the, the, the data scientist role is, it's kind of evolved. And I think there's debate about, what is the difference between a data scientist versus an MLOps engineer versus a machine learning engineer versus like a DevOps engineer versus a data engineer? And in my head, those distinctions become much more relevant in a mature enterprise setting. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, I think MLOps, it's, it's a role or it's a discipline or domain that still works with other roles. So for example, as an MLOps engineer, um, I collaborate really closely with my data science counterparts, uh, with my data engineering counterparts. Uh, we do have those that exist. Um, and I have to say like, it's to me, it's a very kind of valuable collaboration. And more importantly, we all have skill sets and experiences in different areas. Our concerns are gonna be much more different. We don't necessarily want data scientists to, you know, constantly be retooling the same pipelines over and over again, when maybe the only difference is actually the model and the data input. Now that's significant, but in terms of all the other infrastructure that develops around that, there's no reason why that shouldn't be templated and uh, cookie cuttered and why they can't just go like, I know I need this pattern. Um, I know I, I want to do a streaming recommendation service, for example. So they should be able to say, okay. Uh, give me the pattern that is best for a streaming recommendation service. And we should essentially have that ready to serve. That's, that's my personal philosophy of the, we are very much, yes, we're an infrastructure engineering team, but we are also, if we think about it, internal developer advocates, we are internal developer tool, like internal tool developers for our main customers, which is data scientists. Cool. That's a really nice explanation. Eliminating unnecessary distractions is one of the central principles of my lifestyle. As such, I only subscribe to a handful of email newsletters, those that provide a massive signal to noise ratio. One of the very few that meet my strict criterion is the Data Science Insider. If you weren't aware of it already, the Data Science Insider is a 100% free newsletter that the Super Data Science team creates and sends out every Friday. We pour over all of the news and identify the most important breakthroughs in the fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. The top five, simply five news items. The top five items are handpicked, the items that we're confident will be most relevant to your personal and professional growth. Each of the five articles is summarized into a standardized, easy to read format, and then packed gently into a single email. This means that you don't have to go and read the whole article, you can read our summary and be up to speed on the latest and greatest data innovations in no time at all. That said, if any items do particularly tickle your fancy, 
then you can click through and read the full article. This is what I do. I skim the Data Science Insider newsletter every week. Those items that are relevant to me, I read the summary in full. And if that signals to me that I should be digging into the full original piece, for example, to pour over figures, equations, code, or experimental methodology, I click through and dig deep. So, if you'd like to get the best signal-to-noise ratio out there in data science, machine learning, and AI news, subscribe to the Data Science Insider, which is completely free and no strings attached, at superdatascience.com DSI. That's superdatascience.com DSI. And now, let's return to our amazing episode. All right, so now that we know what ML Ops is, and later on in the program, I'll have questions for you about things like what the key skills, what the key ML Ops skills are for data scientists. So maybe you're in a smaller organization where you don't have the luxury of ML Ops specialists in your company. So what are the key ML Ops things that data scientists need to know on those smaller teams? Uh, but before we get to that, let's talk about uh, your ML Ops course that I mentioned. So uh, what are you going to cover in that? When's it going to come out? When can we get it? Yeah, so uh, the first course, I'm, I'm thinking of a series of courses. Um, the first one is going to be an intro to MLOps course. Mm -hmm. um, when it's coming out, I am targeting uh, three or four months from now. We'll see how that goes, right? You know, the whole saying, man plans, God laughs. You know, there's that. Uh, so we'll see how that how that works out. In terms of the coverage, so I see a lot of courses out there where they have like a certain implementation that they are proposing and there are certain assumptions. Uh, my, my Actually, my favorite project out there is the ML Ops at Reasonable Scale slash You Don't Need a Bigger Boat project uh, by Jacob. That is fantastic because he directly kind of set, you know, contradicts this idea that ML Ops is an enterprise only concern. Um, but with that being said, there are tons of courses out there, tons of implementations that are going on. My goal with the Intro to ML Ops course is to kind of take it a a step up, you know, a higher level of abstraction and go, well, why do you need all these things? Because what I feel like is people get stuck in the, oh, this, the best tool for X, Y, Z. And what you, what I feel a successful ML ops engineer needs is to be able to think in terms of decision trade-offs and also what is the like overall architecture and what is the, uh, you know, the roadmap and the North Star of where they want to get to with with their project because the tools or the like pattern or architecture that let's say for example a solopreneur sets up it's going to be different from the way for example we maybe do things at mailchimp or google scale amazon scale right. or even um let's say a, a company that's not traditionally tech ge maybe right. um you know like the current concerns they have and also their starting port points are going to be way different and so to me, what is most important is that someone is able to like uh, look at the starting point, look at kind of where they want to go and then start saying like, okay, what are the concerns we re really care about? How do we stack rank it? And then how do we attack it with architecture that is not just for the here and now, but is maybe for like 10 X growth. And that to me is like what I ideally think um, I want to get at with the course is helping people first understand that higher level of like, what are the concerns we're getting at? What are the different kind of designs and trade-offs that people need to make? And then following courses after that, we'll go into a little bit more of the technical implementation. We'll go into like, for example, if you're um, if you're a career changer or if you're someone who's interested in pivoting into that area, you know, what are the things that you would want to develop? How does your portfolio, you know, look like? How do you want to prepare your LinkedIn resume? So we'll have I'll have a series of those, but cool. that's what the first one is about. Nice. That sounds great. There's uh yeah, that kind of high level philosophy of what machine learning ops is for and how you can be uh, creating infrastructure that allows data scientists uh, to be supported even after 10x growth. That makes a lot of sense to me. And it will be great to have those kinds of career tips as well. I'm sure our listeners will uh, love to receive those. Um, and we will have some career tips actually <laughs> in this very episode. So in addition to the uh, video course, that you're creating, you also have live workshops coming up. Yep, absolutely. I'm, I'm very excited for those. Um, I'm starting to, those will be a little bit more on the technical implementation side. 
but I'll also have some that maybe talk more to also about like best practices around MLOps. Nice. And then, so with those things forthcoming, like your course, your workshops, um, at the end of the episode, I always ask for how people should follow you, but it feels like I might as well ask right now <laughs> so that uh, listeners have a sense of what they can be doing to make sure that they don't miss out um, when these resources are released. Yeah, absolutely. So my main platforms I'm going to be living on uh, are LinkedIn, uh, Medium, and YouTube. Um, I'm grateful to the thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for the support. Um, those are the, you know, the three where content will either be announced or released uh, with my, let's say I mentioned Substack, Medium and Substack. They're, they're married for now. So I think either is good. Uh, Substack will ultimately be where I land on. Um, people can also follow me on GitHub itself because that's where I intend to release the code demos and the sample projects. And I also occasionally yell at people on Twitter. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and then so with things like your personal Substack, um, you intend on having a twice monthly cadence with technical blog posts. And then on your YouTube channel, which I'm blown away because you already have a thousand subscribers to your YouTube channel, but you've only released a few short videos. Like they're really short. They're like less than a minute. Uh, and so people are obviously itching to get the MLOps content. And so that what, what you're planning on doing is having the personal sub stack have these technical blog posts, and then you follow those up with videos on YouTube that take advantage of your capability as a um, as someone who can create visuals uh, and videos. You seem to have a lot of experience with that kind of stuff. And so you can create um, fun and entertaining ways of bringing to life the technical stuff that you publish in Substack. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, um... It is great for if someone, so the, the, my channels and all that, um, if you are someone who is kind of looking for that big sister mentor, I'm going to be your gal, uh, specifically, you know, I try to emulate the mentors and the, um, educators and influencers I, I had in my life. Um, especially in assuming that most people are probably going to start from a different place you know, then maybe say a more traditional candidate. And so my goal is, is to target like that audience for people who are like, oh God, this is just so confusing. Why, why do we have another job title name? Data scientist, data engineer, like why do we have more? So people are a little bit confused, um, you know, and maybe want a little bit of a friendlier voice. Uh, you know, I recommend them to definitely come to the channels. Nice. Uh, and then on top of all that, on top of all of your personal content creation, your MLOps course, your live workshops, your personal Substack, your YouTube channel. You also do writing for other blogs like NVIDIA. You recently had a post for NVIDIA uh, that was an introduction to speech AI. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely like a really fun process. Um, you know, I appreciate my um, partners in the tech space, especially the ones who are kind of recognizing that, hey, you know, MLOps is not just about tools. It's not just about, uh, you know, like fancy use cases. It's not just about helping companies not get sued for stuff, um, but also recognizing that it is also a valuable area for individual uh, practitioners. So, yeah, so that article was fun. Um, would definitely check it out, especially since NVIDIA is doing some really cool stuff um, with uh, Texas speech and also speech generation. Very cool. Yeah, NVIDIA is doing a lot of the cool stuff in AI, period. Um, so we have alluded to you having a job <laughs> on top of uh, doing all of this content creation, which I will have questions near the end of the episode on how you managed to do all of this at the same time. But uh, so your day job is working at MailChimp, which was acquired by Intuit. And there you're a senior software engineer responsible for ML ops and infrastructure. So um, I was introduced to MailChimp uh, many years ago through their ads on the Serial podcast. And um, so they had these funny, really memorable ads where they had all these people saying, MailChimp? 
uh, like mispronunciations of MailChimp. And I don't know, they were really catchy, really weird. And all these years later, I still use MailChimp <laughs> uh, for my email newsletters. Um, so I think MailChimp is a cool company. They definitely make it easy for me to make email newsletters. And in recent years, they have branched out into um, lots of different ways of marketing to your audience, uh, not just email newsletters. Um, and then when was it, when was the acquisition by Intuit? That was just in the last year or two, wasn't it? Yep. That was in November of last year, November, 2021. Um, and so, yeah, so you're, you're working on the MailChimp products. Technically you're a part of the bigger Intuit company. Um, so what is it like to be a senior software engineer responsible for ML ops and infrastructure at, uh, at Intuit? Yeah, I mean, um, first off, I there's certain I lo I love my work. I do love my work. Um, second part is so in terms of like what my day to day looks like. Uh, you know, first off, we are a vital partner to the, our data scientists on um, uh, pipeline and model architectures. So you know, going back to that definition of ML ops earlier, I I really kind of view it some people view ml ops as a as a practice or domain that could be shared by multiple part you know multiple teams uh data science and data engineering and so on and so forth and i think in smaller companies that is definitely the case a lot of times people are implementing ml ops best practices without necessarily having someone assigned to the role because all of ml ops best practices i would argue is a extension of devops you know um but so we are a core engineering team so we consult with the data scientists uh, we assist with infrastructure and ops specific tasks, uh, troubleshoot bugs in our tooling, um, develop new features for make it even easier to productionize data science models. Uh, you know, there's also mentoring opportunities. So currently I have an intern um, that I'm mentoring. Uh, we also do on call like a lot of other like infrastructure and platform teams. So we make ourselves available, you know, on certain days from like nine to five to, you know, to help unblock any issues that come up. Um, you know, and I have significant opportunities also to impact the the culture and the hiring. So I, I, I really, really enjoy it. And especially in the ML ops space, you know, it's, it's like we're building the plane as we're flying it. Um, a lot of the practices we are borrowing from other disciplines that came before us. So there are things we're going to have to, you know, as an industry, as, um, as a domain, as a practice, uh, not just my team, but also the wider sort of, uh, you know, group of ML ops practitioners, there are some things we're going to have to figure out because traditional software development, there are certain assumptions that are baked in there that a machine learning product just like throws out the window, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I really, I really enjoy it. And I'm, I'm really excited for the kind of work that we're doing too, for sure at MailChimp. Um, you mentioned their DevOps. And so that just got me thinking about this potential parallel. I'd, lo I'd love to hear your feedback on this. I'm just kind of sure um riffing on this idea here but would you say that it's fair to make the parallel that devops supports software engineering uh analogously to the way that ml ops supports data science and machine learning model development is that like a would you say that that's a reasonable comparison yeah absolutely and i think um i think other things too so ml ops so it's quite fascinating. So one blog post I, I'm, I'm working on, I also did a Twitter thread on this, was, um, you know, looking at kind of, I don't want to say like the genesis of MLOps, but yeah, kind of looking at the genesis of MLOps, because a lot of the tools that even in DevOps that we use, for example, um, for example, Jenkins, Docker, Kubernetes, uh, they were developed in, well, they were released in their, you know, first stable versions only between like 2012 and 2015, which is a relatively young timeline. Like mm -hmm. when I was going back into, cause I was very interested in like, you know, w our stuff is so new in a way, the practices are so new. Like why are some of these things so difficult? And when I looked at the tooling, because tooling is a big part of the conversation with ML ops, um, mm -hmm. Jenkins, uh, Docker, Kubernetes, TensorFlow, PyTorch, those were only released like within maybe the last five to eight years. 
as like a first stable version, which is really fascinating. Um, GitHub, I think, was released around 2008. So it's fascinating because people enter the field and they don't always have the history and context to understand what what came before, you know. And I think having that understanding, when you realize how much of what, how so much of the cool technology that we're doing, um, yes, Jan LeCun might have been working on deep learning years ago. And some of the initial foundational deep learning papers were like pre 2000s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in terms of the tooling and the practices and the technology around supporting ML ops at like machine learning products at scale, mm-hmm. that has only been within a s- so short period of time. Yeah. Those tools are still developing our ability to use them and how we think we should use them is also just very nascent. So I think there's there's still more to come for sure. Let's talk about some of those key tools in more detail. So you mentioned what are probably the big three in MLOps, I'm going to assume, Docker, Jenkins, and Kubernetes. So let's start with Docker and kind of explain to the listeners what Docker containers are and how they allow um, data science work to be um, easier to spin up and easier to replicate. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it was really funny because <laughs> I had written a blog post on, um, it's called the why of uh, virtual environments, uh, containers and VMs. Because I remember when I was first moving more into like the ML engineering and then ML ops um, role, I so I'd worked as a data scientist for a few years and, uh, you know, I had developed models in a Jupyter notebook. I spit out a pickle file and I have no idea what to do with it. <laughs> and more importantly, too, you know, I was just kind of using tools and uh, practices that I was either taught in like a boot, you know, as I taught my boot camp or that I would pick up um, from people around me. And, you know, for example, a lot of times people would say like, oh, you're struggling. On, go use Anaconda. Go, go use XYZ but they would never help me understand the why of it. And so I like to think of Docker containers. So we think about, and I have a bias towards Python. So, you know, that's just a warning for, I guess, listeners, right? You're doing doing production deployments. So that makes sense. Ah, ha, 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 Um, (laughs) All the R people are probably up in arms going like, how dare you? Um, But if we look at, for example, we have a computer, right? That is... Uh, it could be a laptop, it could be a a more server grade computer, but you have the hardware, you have all the applications, everything is on the OS, um, lots of fun ways to screw it up. Um, you know, but you have so much control and also it, it's physically in front of you. We can kind of think of like a Docker container and virtual environments as representing kind of different layers of abstraction. So a virtual environment on, uh, let's say for Python, it's kind of analogous to like a project folder. You have a, a, a language binary that sits in that folder. You import like whatever libraries you need, scikit-learn, all that. Mm-hmm. It's all sits in there. And then you can kind of like switch in and out of it. And the idea is that you're not messing up your core like Python 2.7, right? That's running your laptop. Um, then you have a, a, we'll talk about a virtual machine, right? A virtual machine is just a step up from an actual physical computer. You have lots of options. For example, you can have multiple OSs going on it, uh, which means you can have multiple uh, stacks of of languages, of applications, of programs. Um, we go a step up above a, a VM or step down, actually, and you have a Docker container. A Docker container, it allows you to have that separation and encapsulation of the work that you're doing. You still share like an OS kernel, but essentially kind of, it's just one more layer of abstraction where with a a physical computer, you have the most amount of granularity, security, all that, as long as it's not connected to the internet. Um, With a VM, you have a little bit like less control, a little bit less granularity, but it's a lot more flexible. Um, You have containers, which are even more flexible. They're a little bit more lighter weight. Mm-hmm. And then you have virtual environments. And the fun part is you could have all of them on a single thing. So my physical computer can have a VM on it, which can then have multiple containers on it, which can then have multiple virtual environments on it. So it's not an either or, but it, it's that aspect of like thinking through the hierarchy of like, what are your specific needs that you, that you have? 
or the, your security requirements and how you adjust that. If you're a data scientist that is just trying out different projects, usually a virtual environment will be great. But if you're a data scientist that is seriously considering putting something to production, you'd want to use a container. Um, yeah, yeah. And more than likely, for people who are like, well, about container versus a VM, every time you launch a container to GCP or AWS, it's actually running on a VM. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's not an either or. Right. It's just some of that decision is being made for you as, you know, as a data scientist. Yeah, and I think Docker containers provide just the right level of abstraction for the vast majority of data scientist use cases because yeah. it allows you often to you you provide this Docker file that specifies exactly what operating system and yeah. software dependencies will be available once that Docker container is running. And yep. um, there are lots of pre-compiled Docker images. So you can, uh, yeah, that that are very yep. easy to download, that have exactly what you need, like have scikit-learn, have TensorFlow, and you know that everything is going to work together nicely. Um, and so, yeah, I highly recommend that if you're not using Docker containers already as a data scientist, that you explore that possibility. Um, because it means that you can very easily replicate things because you're not, you're not changing, you, you don't necessarily need to change the library versions in that container. So you can have a, a particular data science experiment that you run on a particular set of data with specific versions of all the software libraries specified in that Docker file. Um, and then so you can come back to that a year later or two years later, and maybe even though in your local environment you've changed and now you're using a much newer version of PyTorch and it would clash with the version that you were using a year ago or two years ago, it doesn't matter because that you had specified in the Docker container you were using for that experiment a year or two ago, this specific PyTorch version, and uh, it's going to run just like it did uh, in the past. So it makes it really easy to to keep being able to run your code um, years later. And then something that you alluded to there, Makiko, was security. Um, and uh, this is another uh, great thing about having these Docker containers is that they're separate from the rest of what you're doing on your system. So um, you can mess around in that Docker container and it's not going to ruin your whole computer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it was really meant to solve the uh, it worked on my computer <laughs> statement. Right, um, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you're if you're a data scientist who who is serious about developing applications and software, um, a cloud is a huge thing. Cloud is a huge thing, and having Docker containers, a lot of people I think concern themselves probably unnecessarily about vendor lock in, especially if you're an individual uh, practitioner. Um, and containers give you that some of that flexibility in being able to, um, you know, play around with different cloud providers for sure. Yeah. So you can, I mean, that's the other key piece here. Like I gave the analogy of wanting to be able to continue to use some data science code, some data science experiment that you'd written a year or two ago, but the much more common application, the analogy that I should have made is that it allows you to pass your Docker container off to anybody. Uh, in your organization or outside your organization, and then they can run your code exactly the way that you did. So thank you for making that point. Um, and so, all right, so that gives listeners an introduction to Docker containers if they weren't already familiar with them. Then what can we do with Kubernetes and Jenkins once we have those Docker containers? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, with Jenkins, right? Um, some of the other tools that are used in place of Jenkins include uh, GitHub Actions, I think Circle CI, BuildKite. Essentially, like it's a CI CD tool. Um, so it's super, super important. What is CI CD? Yeah, so CI CD CD is continuous integration, continuous uh, delivery, continuous deployment. It describes the practice of, well, it describes a lot of things. But mainly, it's the practice of uh, automating code uh, for continuous integration. It's uh, building and testing uh, applications and software for continuous delivery. It's actually releasing the code 
to like a production server. And then for continuous deployment, it's actually deploying it either to like a server or deploying it to an audience. Um, rolling it out is also like rollout is also included in this continuous continuous deployment. Um, and this is a, a a crucial component of ML ops practices because essentially like there's a couple of reasons why. One reason obviously is like we don't want to we don't want the data scientists to manually be doing something that can be automated. Um, for one right. thing, it just makes their lives miserable, but more importantly, it exposes that process to, you know, like fat fingered, like issues. Um, mm -hmm. so making mistakes, just for example, setting up the configuration, you know, like typing in the wrong thing in the YAML file or whatever. Um, also to like, we need, we do need tools like linting. Um, we need to run, um, robust test suite, test suites. Uh, you know, just because we want to make sure we're getting all the bugs before they get to production. And it's also, you don't always have a QA person. And more importantly, the QA person, that's not their, their job isn't to find random bugs. Um, but it's to be an essential partner in terms of thinking about, is the software doing what we intended to do? Um, is it working not in the strictest sense of like, does the code run? But also, you know, is it, does it meet the kind of brand or the the sort of audience that we want to to meet so yeah so ci cd cd it's like an an absolutely crucial part of, of ml ops and of any software really nice so jenkins is an automation tool that allows data scientists processes to be automated in some way to allow for this ci cd cd to take place yep absolutely Cool. And then that leaves us with Kubernetes, which I think is more directly related to Docker containers themselves. Right? Yep. It's a container orchestration tool. Um, so when Docker came out, and it's funny because I think Docker and Kubernetes, they were actually released, the stable first stable versions were released within the same year. Um, I think people recognized pretty soon that if you have hundreds and millions of Docker containers, all with different ports, all accessing different resources. Um, you need some kind of way to orchestrate it and to also kind of create pods, which are these like the individual, they are the individual subunits really within a Kubernetes cluster. We need to figure out a way to actually like scale up, scale down, allocate resources, all that good stuff. And that is also something that you, you typically don't want to do manually. Right. And these are amazing technologies. They had to really be developed by... <laughs> companies that were doing, um, they were solving big challenges around big data, which ultimately set the stage for solving big challenges uh, using models that require big data. So these are, these are awesome tools. And so I don't know the, the technical aspects nearly as well as you would, but I think the kind of general idea here is that when a data scientist has defined some machine learning program that can run inside a Docker container, um, or you could even have your entire web application running inside a Docker uh, container. And maybe that web application happens to have some machine learning algorithms running in it. With Kubernetes, with this orchestration tool that you're describing, you can then have a system that is automatically responsive to the load. So, oh, we have more and more users logging in than we were expecting in our baseline assumption. You don't need to wake up and start up some servers and have uh, you know manually set some Docker containers running on those servers, Kubernetes automatically gets those servers up and running, gets the Docker containers running on those servers, and all of a sudden, bam, your web application can handle a thousand times or a million times more people than you're anticipating when you went to bed. Yeah, absolutely. Like It is a crucial component of that. Now, it's fun because the question of should data scientists know infrastructure like mm -hmm. Kubernetes? Should they, under, should, should they have to know how to set it up and how to run it? That is a very polarizing question like within mm -hmm. the ML ops community because um, you know, for a time there was this idea that a data scientist should have to know so much of, of, of this infrastructure piece. They, sh they should have to know the end to end, especially if they call themselves an ML engineer. And I remember when some key blog posts around that came out and I thought about it, and I went, this is just very, this is such an unreasonable expectation for data scientists. It, it's, it's, so we're asking them to be responsible for dealing with business partners, 
working with legal to ensure compliance. They're also now responsible for uh, future generation and engineering mall training for making sure that their data sets are clean, making sure their malls are performant, making sure they get deployed. And suddenly now they're also responsible for the infrastructure to develop that. When enterprise teams have full on teams of five to 20 people staffed to that. Right. So it's it's nice to see that the pendulum has swung back to you no know, data scientists should not have to ruin their lives focusing on a million things. Instead, it should be a collaboration, a partnership between different teams of different skills and experiences to deliver on the same thing. I'm very happy that the industry has you know swung back to not trying to hurt people. <laughs> nice. So what would you say? are the most essential ML ops skills that data scientists should know anyway, even if they don't necessarily have to? Yeah, absolutely. So number one, reversion control. That right. is so, so important. I All of us have had that experience where uh, something goes wrong in Git and we just, we don't understand what's going on. It's, it's, you just, and you start stack overflowing, searching, and then you start like randomly copy pasting commands <laughs> into your terminal. Um, <laughs> You know, that's just a nightmare thing. Uh, so I, I would highly recommend, uh, so MIT, they had this missing CS semester course or set of lectures. I have to say that had one of the best lectures I've, I've ever seen on understanding and grokking the spirit of Git and how it works and in specifically version control in general. I would say the missing CS course or semester a set of lectures that has a lot of the key skills that data scientists would need in order to be, uh, I would just say more effective. And I think that's the most important part is just like becoming more effective. So version control is a big part of that. Um, the second part is understanding uh, essentially Python packaging. Or, you know, if you're not using Python, you're using different language, understand the packaging mechanisms for your chosen language is very, very important. Um, third, containerization. I think that is something that, because at the end of the day, models do end up being code. So I think that is a crucial part of data scientists being more effective because now, for example, they're not just relying on vir virtual environments. They're not just relying on conda environments. Um, they understand ways that they can share, reproduce code. It's super important about that. Um, I would say then, I'll just give another two more. So we talked about version control. We talked about um, packaging. We talked about containerization. Yeah. Um, I would say the fourth part is understanding like the tools that are useful for templating their projects. So cookie cutter is an important one. Um, I would say like if people understand how to leverage it, then for example, if a data scientist wanted to create multiple projects, and it's a very similar structure and organization, they could do that. They could set up cookie cutter to do that, to set up like a consistent project structure so that they're not like reinventing the wheel. That's cool. That's and really I would say tip. the, yeah, I, I, I love using that tool. Um, and then I would say the fifth one that's really kind of important is um, understanding at a high level how to leverage some of the cloud resources that we have. Right. So whether it's GCP, whether it's AWS, and I'm not saying become a cloud like practitioner extraordinaire, um, but understand that nowadays most models are they're going to end up being shared. You, you want a model to be shared, right? You want to develop software that other people like using. So understanding in your kind of chosen you know cloud vendor of choice was a minimum viable path to getting your model hosted and getting it shared so that you can either put like a streamlit app on it, you can create a mobile or web app. Those are super important. Any other skills after that, I'd say um, they are important, but those first five, definitely I've seen block uh, junior data scientists and, and I've seen them really struggle with those concepts. Nice, I love it. That was such a great list, Mikiko. So number one is version control tools like Git, and we've got the MIT Missing Computer Science course, which I'll be sure to look up and include in the show notes. Number two is packaging of software libraries. Number three is containerization. Uh, four is templatization uh, with a tool like Cookie Cutter. Um, that is one that I need to brush up on of these five. And number five is familiarity with um, cloud, uh, 
platforms like AWS yep. and GCP. Oh, and the last one, and I think you had this author on your show at one point. Um, he wrote Data Science at the Command Line. The Command Line, awesome. yeah, that is an uh, that is an under underutilized tool. Um, what I found was that when I, for various projects where I need to set up data cleaning and processing pipelines, it was just so much faster to use a shell script. So much faster than trying to import uh, pandas and like, you know, other kinds of libraries. Those were, were very, very slow for stuff that a lot of times could be solved through regex and through some kind of, um, you know, just smart shell usage. So yeah. I would say that that is the, the powerful skill right there. The command line is hugely valuable. It can be a glue between whatever you're doing on your Unix system, which is almost certainly your production system. Um, so yeah, so Jeroen Janssens, he was on episode number 531. So you can get an introduction to this idea of the command line as a glue between all the programming languages and operations that you'd like to carry out on a given system. And yeah, he's got his book, Data Science at the Command Line, that you can check out as well. Awesome. Pico, such a great list. That was a really valuable part of this episode. Thank you. So let's move on here from this very specific uh, technical advice related to what you've been doing uh, in your current role at Intuit MailChimp. And let's talk about what happened before. <laughs> so you transitioned very rapidly in your career from a data analyst to a data scientist, now to a machine learning ops engineer. So do you want to give us some, um, some color as to how that came about? How did you make, how and why did you make these transitions so rapidly? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say, you know, when I, when I graduated college, uh, I studied, um, yeah, I studied in, in the humanities and I had initially gone in thinking I want to do uh, med school. That's the Trinity, you know, it's a uh, doctor, lawyer, engineer, right? Um, right. <laughs> I did not do that. Uh, graduate college and went, what do I do with my life and how do I put rent? How do I pay for a roof over my head? All these How do I questions. put rent on the table? <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> You know, and I was like, I, I need to get a job. I, you know, a lot of my friends, they were doing their internships or they had gone their, their first finance or tech job. And I was just like, wow, I just need someone to employ me. Uh, so I feel like in, especially the early stages, a lot of it was just me trying to pick up skills to be valuable. And eventually after a cer certain point in time, I started to think more about like, well, what do I actually want to do for my career? What is the body of work I want to be producing and contributing to? And also to what kind of work fit with the way I, I viewed the world and how I, how, how I engaged with it. Um, so before my role at MailChimp, before that I had worked as a data scientist for Teladoc. Um, you know, I was developing models. I was doing the analyses, I was trying to understand the business problems. And I'd realized that, you know, for me, the big questions were the bottleneck of getting my models out. Because I would create these, I would, you know, I would train these models in my Jupyter notebook, or at that point, I was just starting to dip the toes into using like VS Code and, you know, full-fledged ID uh, that wasn't uh, Jupyter uh, or Eclipse back when I was doing a, a little bit of Java. Um, but in, and I was struggling so much with this. And I think this is a common experience. A lot of ML ops practitioners shells. You're developing a model or you're an engineer that's trying to help data science developing models. And you're like, why is it so hard to like share it and to get in front of people? Because at the end of the day, that is, that is the power of it. It's not fun when you're just sharing a notebook and you're refreshing. Because your business partners just to get, they, they get tired of that eventually, you know? So in about, uh, what was it? So I joined MailChimp in May 2021. Um, so I would say around, if I remember correctly, six months before that, working as a data scientist at Teldoc, it was in the middle of the COVID quarantine. And, you know, people were like, companies were going through layoffs. Airbnb around that time had a huge layoff. Um, and my company, after they had, Teldoc had, after Lavanga had been acquired by Teldoc, they had been, given everyone a one year employment guarantee. Hmm. And my family was like, you, you hold on to that job, hold on to it. Hit that two year mark. Um, 
but I was really thinking about it. I'm like, I'm really not happy doing this kind of work. I want to be doing more engineering work. And so I decided to quit. I decided to, and it well, was funny, actually, it was before that. So I had applied to OpenAI's fellowship uh, because they they had this program where basically uh, you come come join us, uh, you know, create cool applications and software, we'll pay a stipend. That was actually more than what I was making at Teladoc as a data scientist. And I had applied for it. I'd put my heart and soul into that application and had gotten just rejected. Mm-hmm. And it was it was so crushing to me. And I kept thinking, mm-hmm. I'm like, if I had that fellowship, I I could change my career around. And I didn't get it. And at that point, I'm like, okay, so what am I going to do about this? And I said, okay, well, I will go do my own personal six month sabbatical. Um, so mm-hmm. I quit my job, uh, figured out a learning roadmap plan for myself to formally transition to Elmo Ops. Um, figured out what courses or workshops I want to take. And then got started on that path while also contributing to side projects to, you know, for, for different startups and all that around like building ML pipelines. Um, and eventually I was, I was fortunate to be able to make that transition. Um, I got three offers out of that, out of that job search. What I love was that I didn't do technical interviews for majority of those. When you say, when you say um, job search, that's also like, so you did the, you quit at Teladoc where you were working as a data scientist. Mm-hmm. And you, um, you then developed this six month curriculum for transitioning into MLOps. Was yep, it near the myself. end of that? Yeah. Was it near the end of it that then you started doing the search, or yep. did, were you kind of doing this for how long? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm a big fan of like of essentially trying to keep my of, of trying to keep multiple options on the table. Is really kind of how I approach most of my career. And for me, it's I knew that eventually. I knew that I wanted to transition into getting like a full-time job, but I also knew that, and it was, it was so hard because for me, I grew up in a family that wasn't rich by any means. And for me, money has always been this fear point of, do I have enough money to, you know, keep going? Like, do I have enough money to have autonomy in my career? And so it was, it was like such a scary experience, but I knew it had to be done because I had tried for some time to, you know, do some projects and workshops um, and, and do my own learning around my work schedule. And, you know, I had started interviewing around a lot of people said, look, you know, you seem better as a data scientist. So I knew I was getting some bites there. So I figured, you know, worst case scenario, uh, if the job, if my personal sabbatical and my job search don't churn out well, I can always just get a, I could always like interview and get an offer as a data scientist, but I really want to make that transition into an engineer. Um, and that was, and so I, I stuck with that. I'm really glad I did. Um, and it was, it, it was, it was scary, but I think it sometimes, you know, sometimes you do need to make that big jump, right. For the long term, and mm-hmm. take some short term pain. Mm-hmm. Nice. Well, it's obviously paid off. Yeah. Um, so yeah, congratulations. Yeah. A big risky step there to, to leave guaranteed employment, uh, yep. and to and to have the um, the confidence to create your own curriculum, which has obviously gone well, and probably that kind of thing of creating your own MLOps curriculum that has probably been helpful in developing now your curricula for other MLOps students to come. Yeah, absolutely. Because when I had first developed that roadmap, I had included a lot of like nonsense stuff on there. And I realized I had to hose about 60, 70% of that roadmap plan and focus on the 30% that was most impactful. Uh, some of which includes the skills that we talked about earlier. Um, some of also which included more content around um, developing and designing distributed systems, working a lot with data, uh, packaging up models, understanding kind of if, if you step away, because a, a lot of what I was focused on as a data scientist was how do I get my one model? out the door. And that's just a totally different perspective from MLOps where it's literally like, not how do we get one model out the door, but it's how do we get 20 or 100 models out the door? And how do we do it in a way that we're also not locked in? So if we need to make changes to those pipelines or the data scientists want to just POC stuff, like how do we support that innovation? 
because a lot of times people say, well, innovation and, you know, stability and, um, you know, providing value, they're not, they're totally mutually exclusive activities. But I think there's ways that we can try to kind of meet in the middle. Nice. So something related to your uh, development as an MLOps uh, content creator and MLOps practitioner and your career uh, trajectory in general is that you strive to demystify machine learning careers for what you call non-traditional candidates. So what do you mean by that? What's a non-traditional candidate? And what are the biggest myths that aspiring machine learning practitioners or MLOps practitioners um, face when entering the field? Yeah, absolutely. So non-traditional, so a non-traditional candidate. Um, to me, a non-traditional candidate is someone who, first off, does not have formal study in the discipline or domain that they're going into. Uh, they are candidates who also potentially come from families who don't have um, a history of formal study in that area, and also who you know, I would say are like middle class or. Um, you know, come who essentially don't come from upper class families. I consider my family to be lower middle class. Um, so candidates who maybe don't have all the resources and time in the world, uh, candidates who are also job changers, they have other commitments who essentially don't fit this mold of the person who went through an Ivy League education, who came from a family that had, you know, access to resources, um, and then sort of kind of followed this path of then going into engineering. I am really interested in candidates who are, are very much so like myself, where you didn't have family or you didn't have that roadmap sort of paved for you. And maybe you had to be really scrappy and maybe you still have to be really scrappy in both time and resources. And so those are the people that I'm very interested in, in helping out because I see a lot of myself in them. Um, in terms of um, the myths. And this kind of came out to both in terms of my career working data analytics and data science, but also to, as I was kind of developing that personal roadmap for myself, um, the big one to get out of the way is, um, formal study. So because MLOps, you know, and it's, it's parent DevOps, uh, they're really about building tools and a lot of that building is being done in industry. It's not being taught in classrooms. So on the one hand, um, having a formal CS background, it helps with, it does help. I'm not going to say it doesn't. But I don't want to say either that it is a prerequisite for having a successful career as an MLOps practitioner. Um, the second myth that I sort of want to take out is that you need to be a deep learning machine learning expert. To be successful in MLOps, I you need an appreciation and understanding of the workflows and the stages that data scientists go through. But I feel like a lot of that can be um, gotten from first off practicing empathy. You know, talking to and working with data scientists, understanding uh, kind of their world perspective and how they operate, and being able to do research. That is a huge part of it. Is I do so much research, especially that's the hardest part in developing the courses is I'm going through, I'm reading blog posts, I'm talking to people, I am um, asking really stupid questions on forums that people are kind of not to dunk me for. Um, it's a lot of that, it's figuring out what is going on right now and being able to consolidate that into actionable stuff. Is those, those are, empathy and research are much more valuable skills than necessarily being an experienced uh, practitioner or you know, working practitioner in machine learning. Um, nice. I would say the third myth is that it's all about the tooling. Um, it's really not. The tooling will will come and go. And I'd say we're really like at the beginning of the explosion of like potential tools and MLOps. Um, I really think it's about the foundational knowledge and practice. I think that that is more important than like being an expert in tooling. Um, and the fourth one I want to sort of just get out there is accreditation. 
I talked about like, you know, you don't need a prerequisite. You don't need to have studied the field, but more importantly, I think, um, I like certificates because they give me a structure for how to approach learning a specific topic or tool. But at the end of the day, it really is about, can you build stuff? So I think credentials and certificates are really useful in the learning process, but I don't think they will help as much as like building actual software, building programs, right. building pipelines. Awesome. Those myths, Mikiko, were crystal clear. So number one is that you don't need a formal CS degree to get into MLOps. Number two is that empathy and research are more important than machine learning experience. Foundational knowledge is more valuable than specific tooling experience. And actually building software applications is more important than a formal accreditation. It makes perfect sense. Um, I love those. So alongside these kinds of general tips that you have for people getting into MLOps, um, which have been hugely valuable, you also, as part of your role at MailChimp, you are on the Global Engineering Hiring Committee. So through your vantage point on that hiring committee, what specific advice do you have for people who are looking to get hired into an MLOps role? What are the most important skills? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so part of what I've done at MailChimp is I've helped to design and develop um, our interview process for some of our um, data engineering roles and also our MLOps roles. And also I contribute, as you mentioned, to the Global um, Engineering Hiring Committee for MailChimp, especially uh, the focus on uh, values and culture. And that's huge. Uh, we really care about culture ad as opposed to culture fit. Um, we want people who it's not just like they're cool to work with, but also they will kind of continue to uphold the, um, the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because it honestly, that that's been a really special part of working at MailChimp. Uh, it's first off, I've never seen so many female engineers under one roof mm -hmm. as I, so it's uh, MailChimp is an Atlanta based company. Um, when I was working in Bay area startups and comp and and companies like, um, I did not see that many female engineers on, under the same roof. And on my team alone, we have at least four female ML ops engineers, which is great. And my manager is female too, but it's been so great. And also too, for example, um, in the Bay area, you just don't see that cultural and ethnic diversity that we also see at MailChimp, which is really wonderful. Like I like working with people who look like everyday people that I would interact with. It's fantastic. Uh, people with different um, different abilities, different sort of perspectives and values, but all around these this idea of you're adding something. So that's a huge, huge part of what we care about. So now to get into the actual specific parts of the interviews. Um, so a couple tips of what I've seen, especially for engineers or data scientists. Uh, first tip is uh, know yourself. So for example, I ramble when I get very nervous, which means I do really well with bullet points. Bullet points are my friend. And more importantly, having those stories framed out ahead of time. We see some engineers who they get really, really stuck in the details of like the technical projects they worked on. And then they miss out on the ability to talk about, first off, what was the innovation that you brought to that project? Right. Right. What was the leadership that you engaged in? What were some issues that you proactively identified and then went after it? You know, there's a lot of key values that we're, that we look for. And I think sometimes engineers, they get so focused on the, like, okay, I'm going to talk about this really, really cool project I did where I implemented this microservice and all this other stuff. It's like, no, no, you're missing out on the, the human element on the ability to like display the fact that, uh, first off, you're going to be in the trenches with us. You're going to be, um, delivering software. We can rely on you. So I'd say that's the first one is people should know themselves. Um, they, the second part should be like, understand what values, what are, what are some elements that you are sort of displaying in your storytelling? Um, and I would say the, the third part is humility. So we've, we've had some candidates where we asked them, so like, what was the time that you really screwed up? How did, and you got negative feedback. How did you handle those? And they'll say like, oh, we never got, mm, that didn't happen. We've, we never screwed up. 
We've we've never gone negative feedback. You know, you know what that says to me is actually not that. First off, um, I could believe, and I could believe that for some candidates, but it tells me two things: one, you're either lying, um, or two, in some cases, it's okay. So you've never been put in a position where you had to take ownership of something. Right. You've never been in a position where you had to be accountable for your results. So if we put you, and right now we're building a lot of stuff like plane in the air, right? We're building a plane as we fly it. So how can we know that if we handle a crucial piece or element of a project that's a little bit ambiguous, that you'll be able to kind of dig away at that ambiguity and you'll also be able to make a decision in terms of how to proceed with that project. So that accountability piece, and there is this book called um, Extreme Ownership. That's almost an element of what we kind of want is that ownership that a lot of times you do see in um, people with military experience. Mm-hmm. I think my friend Albert um, talked about this as well. Albert Bellamy? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Luke Burrus too. They're, they're both, you know, former military. They have that experience. And they both talk about extreme ownership. Like ownership is something that I've found a lot of military to have that innate understanding of. Um, and I think that's something that some you know, candidates would probably do well to read up on and to really understand what that means. Awesome. Really great guidance, Mikiko. Uh, So yeah, the key things that you look for in hires from your vantage point as a member of the Global Engineering Hiring Committee at MailChimp is uh, to know yourself, uh, to have a clear story, a clear narrative to convey, Mm -hmm. and humility. Um, and I love that you are looking for culture add over culture fit. That's a yeah. really nice way to describe what you're looking for. Um, I hadn't heard that one before, and it makes a lot of sense to me. All right. So you do a ton. <laughs> On top of your day job, we've talked about your MLOps course, your live workshops, your newsletter, your YouTube channel, the writing that you do for other companies like NVIDIA. Um, on top of all that, you also are a CrossFitter and a bodybuilder. <laughs> so um, that's something near and dear to my heart. If people follow me on social media, then every once in a while you get subjected to my latest uh, lifting PR um, personal record. So do you have any productivity tips or tricks for listeners on how to juggle all of these different things, day job, content creation and fitness and who knows what other hobbies you have out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so something that I kind of had picked up years ago, and this is kind uh, this is similar to like the, have you read the power list where it's like, pick Uh, your five things in a day. And if you finish those five things, it's, it's usually like it's two or three one-offs that can directly contribute to your goals. And then maybe two or three habits that you're working on. And then it, once you kind of just call those, it's almost like an example of Warren Buffett's like, make a list of your top 20 priorities, pick the top five, and then everything else, kill it with fire. Um, So I do something very similar. At the the beginning of every single week, I draw a quadrant for myself that is based on my four sort of key areas with fitness being like kind of not one of those quadrants, but it's a must-have. Um... One quadrant is for my work goals. One quadrant is for my content goals. One quadrant is for my personal learning and development. And another quadrant is actually for, um, so I actually like making and designing clothing. So that's my hmm. my dream dream is to eventually have my own like streetwear brand. Wow. Uh, I took a, work. I, everyone had their activity they did during quarantine. Some people did bread making. For me, it was, um, I took a workshop on how to customize sneakers and how to make them. So that was my thing. Uh, I have a bunch of like Air Jordans right now that I'm kind of just working on, Um, you know, just taking apart the shoe and like buying like different colored leathers and like doing embellishments on it, rebuilding the shoe up. Really fun. Wow. Um, So I set those quadrants for myself and I say, these are things I I must accomplish. And then what I used to do is uh, I used to be part of the 5 a.m. club. I used to do my two, three hours ahead of time. Yeah. Ahead of the workday. Get get that out out of the way. (laughs) Um, unfortunately I work on East coast hours and I'm on the West coast. So for me to get up two, three hours ahead of my peers <laughs> would be really early in the morning. Right. So I don't do that for myself, but what I have done 
is I have, instead of doing like two, three hours, like within the day, I try to listen to like kind of what my energy needs are. And instead, what I do is uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is when I work on my like content projects. Um, I have my workshop right next to me. So if I need a break from work, I literally just turn around and then I just start working on my, on my clothes, on my sneakers, um, you know, learning sort of like new different techniques for, uh, creating like heirloom stuff, but you know, like a more modern contemporary sort of vision. So that's kind of how I do it is like, there's certain things I've determined are energetically intensive. So working on work stuff, working on content is very, very energetically intensive. Um, and other stuff where it's a little bit more fun for me, I instead try to sprinkle it throughout the day or even at the end of the night so I can kind of decompress and making sure that I have those boundaries. Because if I don't have those boundaries, I, I become useless very quickly, including working out. And that's a must have. So I have my own home gym. I have my power cage also in the living room. Um, and I incorporate that. Usually it's around 3 to 4 p.m. when I'm just most tired and I'm most drained. And that's when I have actually the best workouts. Amazing. Well, Makiko, thank you for all of the insights that you provided today across ML ops and productivity and uh, just generally uh, making the most out of a career wherever you start. Um, so as we wind down episodes, I always ask our guests for a book recommendation. Do you have one for us? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, Right now, my focus is continuing to kind of develop my um, writing skills, especially for technical writing. Uh, so two books I found to be immensely useful are uh, The Art and Business of Online Writing and Documentation for Developers from A-Press. And then in terms of like engineering books, I have a bad habit of just kind of bouncing between stuff. So right now I'm like really enjoying Joe and Matt's uh, data engineering book that they released as well as uh, visualizing Google Cloud, which is great. Um, and also the system design interview books by Alex Zhu. Awesome. Those are a lot of great recommendations from clearly a, an avid reader, an outstanding reader, uh, far beyond what most people are capable of. Um, so... I also then end episodes always asking guests for uh, how we should follow them. I think we've got a pretty good sense of this from your episode already. We've got LinkedIn, Medium, YouTube, Substack, uh, and even a little bit of Twitter. Is that right? Yeah. Nice. All right, Makiko. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Super Data Science Show. It's been wonderful to get to know you on air. And we'll have to check in sometime, maybe in a few years, and see how your MLOps world uh, is developing along. And I look forward to checking out your sweet, sweet shoes at that time as well. Absolutely. It was so great talking with you. And thanks so much, John. Well, I hope you enjoyed that deep dive into MLOps with Makiko as much as I did. In today's episode, Makiko filled us in on how MLOps is to data science like DevOps is to software development how Docker, Kubernetes, and Jenkins work together as three of the key tools in the MLOps practitioner's belt, how culture add is more important than culture fit in prospective hires, and the six most essential MLOps skills for data scientists, namely version control, software library packaging, containerization, templatization of project structure, such as with cookie cutter, familiarity with cloud environments like AWS and GCP, and a strong command of the command line. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Makiko's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 599. That's superdatascience.com slash 599. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel, I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. 
All right. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Yvonne and Siebert, Mario Palmo, Serge Massis, Sylvia Ogvang, and Kirill Aramenko on the Super Data Science team for managing, editing, researching, summarizing, and producing another wicked episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon. <laughs>